we are fortunate to be hosting today the practically the two top authorities and experts on uh, human rights in the DPRK. And first, let me go to Her Excellency uh, Yi Xinhua, uh, Republic of Korea, ambassador at large for North Korean human rights, also professor of uh, political science at Korea University, political science and international relations. Ambassador Leo bio is very long, but let me just mention that you, you are special advisor to UN Secretary General Kofi Annan um, on uh, the London Independent Inquiry. You're also a recipient of the fourth uh, Nagasone Asukiro Award of Excellence. Uh, UN peacekeeping operations, multilateral and comprehensive approaches to human security and humanitarian issues are also part of your portfolio. Thank you very much for joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for coming here to share this thought about North Korean human rights issues. Well, given my 15 minutes, I will try to highlight in the like, three sections. Number one, my observation on North Korean situation. Number two, the major challenges to address the North Korean uh, the human rights problems, a major challenges I'm talking. And then third, then what we should do. Uh, the first, in terms of the North Korean human rights situation, over the past two and a, two and a half months, I diligently uh, talked with uh, the more than several people, expertise and organizations and various meetings. And plus uh, I have uh, some uh, native knowledge of the North Korean <laughs> issues as well. So, so gathering all those issues, uh, I will just uh, talk about this. Speaking of the North Korean human rights issue within North Korea, it, uh, I would say it's a kind of the so-called quagmire. Like everybody talks about it for long, but nobody virtually know about the exact fact. That leads us to a great deal of speculation and controversies that also can be often used for political purposes. That's what we call politicization. According to the Freedom House Index 2022 this year, they, they, so in this, they just studied about 210 countries. I don't know how they define 200 countries, why we member state have 193. But anyway, the, the political rights for, for North Korea is a zero out of the total 40. And the uh, civil right is a uh, score three out of 60. So that it turned out to be the score three out of uh, the total of the 100. When it comes to North Korean economy since 2017, it was obviously worsened, mainly because of international sanction in the wake of the North Korea's missile and nuclear test, and then also the, of course, the COVID-19. In particular, foreign trade that declined very sharply, mainly because of the greater border uh, shutdown by the, by the North Korean regime, and that obviously lead to the food shortages, particularly for North Korean ordinary people. And the uh, effect of sanction, um, I do believe the sanction, international sanction was not strong enough to give a big blow to the North Korean regime itself, but that sanction was critical enough to make a big suffering to the North Korean people who already have a difficult times on their daily life. And uh, one thing we noted too is, uh, however, compared to the, what happened in North Korea in the 1990s, mid 1990s, it's not quite yet the level of the mass starvation mainly because uh, uh, they have a market and also they have external aid from uh, the China and then so on. So that reminds me of the Amatir Sen, who is the Nobel uh, Economic Laureate on the food entitlement problems. Like the food security problem driven not necessarily by food availability, but because of the food entitlement, like uh, access to food is more important. I think that reminds us why human rights issue is very much closely related to food security issue. A grain harvest or grain import have uh, increased slightly from the last year. I'm talking about this year, the grain import, uh, because the market has resumed and also there are external uh, support from China as well. So as I said, the possibility of mass starvation is unlikely at this point, but we have to look for the beyond the Pyongyang. People argue that the total North Korean population is about 25 million people, appears to exist for the sake of 2.5 million Pyongyang people. 
and those 2.5 million uh, Pyongyang uh, people appears to exist for 250 uh, political economy elite or political party members we can easily see in the, the, the nationwide TV. Um, so we have to think about those vulnerable groups beyond the Pyongyang has to have you know, like a, the more priority to be given, uh, in particularly those the women and the children. Um, and then speaking of the COVID pandemic, probably that is unfortunately only promote regime solidarity or regime security vis-a-vis -vis human security. It appears that North Korea using a quarantine as a kind of excuse to strengthen its grip on containment and control while engaging in human rights violations. Egregious human rights violations, including those involving extrajudicial or arbitrary killing and torture, is also uh, as a problematic. Well, I talk about North Korean uh, people within North Korea, and uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip for the problem of the refugee defectors. But a third component of the human rights issue have to be human rights violation being committed by the North Korean regime against citizens of South Korea and other countries. Like, uh, for example, POWs and the post-war abductees and detainees. The post-war POW, uh, the, the number is obviously very controversial and nobody exactly knows how many, but the allegedly 60, I mean, the, approximately 60,000 POWs uh, were taken uh, hostage in, during the Cold War plus minus, and then only a little bit over 8,000 POWs were returned. And it was not until the mid 1990s when lots of the defectors came to South Korea, uh, what happened to the rest of those the POWs. Uh, like 80 plus POW was found among those North Korean, uh, thousands, the tens of thousands of the North Korean defectors who finally arrived in the, North, the, the, the South Korea since mid 1990s. But they said some family members also included among the North Korean defectors. The POWs were assigned, according to them, POWs were assigned to forced labor, uh, including the coal mine, and three generations of their families were discriminated against being labeled as a hostile social class. And I was told that they are called as a, the, the, the children of the number 43. That by now, the most POWs are likely deceased because if they, serve, if, if, if they still live, they're about over 90 or 100. And uh, now our well, problem is what to do with the family members. post for North Korean abductees are about uh, over 3,830 South Koreans of which more than 500 still remain in North Korea. Their family members in South Korea have also long suffered psychological and materialistic damages. I think this is the issue as well, uh, uh, clearly require accountability. Second is about major challenge to address the problem. Number one, priority gap, nuclear issue versus human rights issues. International community spent a lot of years and years, if not decades, to address the problem of the denuclearization issues. So that North Korean human rights issue have to be always ready to be sidelined whenever those big issues is coming up. So the CDID turned out to be a deception of the international community because the Kim Jong-un declared uh, their country as a nuclear state as the state. And then he said that his declaration is irreversible. I think that term irreversible is uh, just quoted from CDID. So that's why as the ambassador Huang has mentioned, I think of North Korean militarization and human rights abuses should be on two sides of the same coin. But how we can deal with it is very important. Number two is a human rights accountability versus humanitarian issue. I still believe the, the accountability should be the given the priority. However, the humanitarian assistance has to be seriously considered in my term and the rubric also for the constructive engagement. Uh, that is not something I just echo the, the South Korea's previous government uh, talking about humanitarian assistance instead of human rights, uh, considering the so-called special inter-Korean relations. I don't mean that, but I believe that humanitarian assistance is important because it is a core tool to improve human rights of the North Korean ordinary people. Third is universal human rights versus universally applied. You know, universal declaration on human rights. That is our beautifully and the most consensus, consen mostly agreed uh, like a declaration by the international community. I would like to recall you that um, in 1948, 
over the two years, there have been 1,400 voting what take, took place in order to adopt this declaration. And they said uh, at that time, there are 59 member states was very carefully uh, uh, like, uh, draft the declaration word by word. So finally, we have uh, this universal human rights uh, standard. But unfortunately, the, it's not uh, quite universally applied at this moment. The, the international community, including the UN, is more divisive and then more uncertain. And then it was politicized. And then uh, those who don't agree with the North Korean human rights abuses is a harshly criticized that is a politicization with a double standard as we witnessed uh, the two days of interactive dialogue uh, in the United Nations. And they say it's fabricated by the, the, the West. The fourth is a, uh, China and Russia appear to share the vulnerability with North Korea. Uh, so, and also as the, the, the China and the US competition or conflict is getting heightened, I think they tend to be more uncooperative and also objective about whatever the United Nations try to do. Fifth is, uh, unfortunately, North Korean human rights issue appears to become less visible and less attentive, not only because of the international community faces urgency such as Ukraine and also energy crisis, but not, not only that, but also for fatigue symptoms. But we've been talking about the 20 years plus of our North Korean human rights issue. Nothing has changed. So why we have to keep talking about it? So those things was the big problems as well. Then what to do? Once again, accountability and constructive engagement is important. Number one, monitor, report, and document are the critical for prosecuting, criminalizing, and punishing perpetrators in order to eradicate a vicious cycle of structural impunity and promote and support effective means of revealing truth and securing justice for victims. And as the ambassador check was mentioned as well, and those accountability will be a great measure for preventive other actions. And you remember those that it's not possible now, we can do it you know, when sometime, right? Sometime that has to be that for surely. As you see, even now after 70 plus years, we are still talking about Nazi criminals. Um, and I echo the, in that sense, I echo with the, the special apartment Simon was talking, Security Council to refer to the situation to the ICC and General Assembly to release annual report and establish an ad hoc uh, tribunal of uh, uh, comparable entities. And then China and Russia, so North, uh, uh, I want to make sure the North Korean defector should not be forcefully repatriated to uh, uh, the North Korea, where they are subject to the, the, the severe crime against humanity. But still, I, I think we should also respect China and Russia's sovereignty in a way, so that we have to be carefully and diligently talk about what kind of a deliberate diplomacy we can do it to make sure the safety and survival of the North Korean defectors. UN Security Council should resume holding a public debate on the human rights situation in North Korea. Uh, well, we have a differing views and we have both strenuous objections, of course, but at least we need a nine affirmative votes in order to make that this open discussion officially in the Security Council. Second is engagement. North Korean regime allow international organization and foreign embassy uh, return for humanitarian assistance. I think that's very important because it means that the need to come up with a better way to provide humanitarian aid and draft a more effective overall strategies to fundamentally improve the lives of North Korean people. I think that is the gist of why we need humanitarian assistance. Then very briefly, what I to, what I to do since I just used up my time. Close and stronger coordination and cooperation among like-minded countries are very important. In the meantime, how to persuade and engage with so-called swing states are uh, equally important. So I would like to define and institutionalize what constitutes North Korean human rights. For that, we politicize international consensus to overcome lack of definition and fact are uh, very important. For that, consistent and systematic collaboration among the public, government, academic, and international organization, including the UN, in the form of dialogue or form uh, critical. In other words, there has to be countering, uh, I'm sorry, continuing and comprehensive and arduous efforts to establish a consensus in regards to North Korean human rights situation and what we mean by North Korean human rights. North Korean human rights 
must include not only the right to food, but also that have to include right to know. For that, dissemination of reliable information is very important. Uh, last but not least, I would like to tell you that for us, North Koreans, North Koreans are not anybody, but they are part of us. For that, I genuinely call for international communities continued attention and continued support uh, to improve the human rights of uh, North Korea's ordinary people who can, who have, who deserve all the rights we now are enjoying. So I'll stop here. That's me, Shinhua. Thank you very much for a very inspiring presentation and for an impressive task list. There is a lot of work ahead of us. And now, uh, please allow me to introduce our next speaker, Her Excellency Elizabeth Salmon, who is a special rapporteur on the Human Rights Association of EPRK. Um, special rapporteur Salmon is a scholar and human rights defender, professor of international law at the Faculty of Law of the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. Her areas of expertise align perfectly with our task list as we deal with DPRK human rights, public international law, international human rights law, international criminal law, international humanitarian law, and transitional justice. And that was a terrific report you presented before the third committee. You didn't have much time to, to work on this report, and yet everybody is, is truly impressed. So Elizabeth, thank you very much. I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Thanks to everybody here for inviting me to also give thanks to the Embassy of Lithuania for this great initiative. On Wednesday, I have my first interactive dialogue with the member states and uh, at the third committee. For the past 18 years, this presentation before the third committee has been a precious opportunity for the mandate to lay out uh, special rapporteurs' assessments, plans, and concerns about the most pressing matters at hand. On the other side, I believe this meeting in small group is also very convenient, setting to discuss more openly how to improve North Korean people's human rights. Recently, the world has been paying attention to the DPRK because of the threat posed by its missiles and the possible development of nuclear weapons. In contrast, we heard almost nothing about how people are living in a country whose borders have been shut for nearly, nearly three years. This is partially due to the impact of even more stringent domestic measures limiting freedom of expression, including access to information, strict restrictions of freedom of movement, and the sharp fall in the number of escapees leaving the country. It is a challenging task, but there is no doubt that we need to focus on 25 million North Korean people, not in abstract. A way speaking only of the DPRK or North Korea, but as a concrete human collectivity undergoing hardship and abuses. In this way, we would be ready to reckon what the international community acts or omissions regarding the DPRK would mean to the people. Because addressing exclusively the issue of missiles and nuclear weapons will not improve the human rights situation of the North Korean people. And on the other hand, had may not fundamentally solve security issues either. In the past decades, we have learned that the victims of human rights violations must be the focus of any human rights or humanitarian endeavor. The legitimacy and effectiveness of our work rests on a victim-centered approach. I will assume a victim-centered approach as a guiding principle of this mandate which entails among many things providing more opportunities for the voices of victims to be heard. During my visit to the Republic of Korea, some of the information of, on the current situation that I have received has been alarming. One of the recent escapees told me that the price of products had gone up by six, seven times by early 2021, and that rice from military reserve had been released to soldiers. With the prolonged shutdown of the border, I am worried about what is happening to the 40% of the population who already experienced food insecurity before the COVID-19 outbreak. I'm also concerned about people's access to health since the COVID-19 outbreak. 
I heard from experts that the health system would struggle to cope with a large number of patients. I'm also concerned about the lack of medicine available because of the prolonged border closure. The information about the situation has developed during the COVID-19 and the quarantine measures is very poor. There are powerful reasons to feel concerned for the hardship North Korean people are enduring under this period of complete isolation, in particular women and girls. Mm, the previous mandate holders uh, provided a wide range of information about the human rights situation in the DPRK. I will take a stock of it and will try to place emphasis on a more detailed analysis of the human rights situation of a specific groups. I think that highlighting a specific groups hopefully will improve understanding of the current situation of their human rights and explore ways to better protect and promote their human rights. I will identify specific groups according to two criteria. First, according to the PRK's international obligations and commitments, and second, groups whose situation needs urgent attention. Based on these criteria, I have decided to start my work addressing women and girls' situation. There are very issues I would like to focus on. Women in detention, which is well documented by the office in Seoul, the office of the High Commissioner, I mean, uh, human trafficking and gender-based -based violence on women, of women crossing the borders, women's sexual and reproductive health and rights, women in Jiang Madan, I don't know if it's the, the, the right pronunciation, uh, I mean local information markets, economic and social participation and opportunities, DPRK's engagement with UN human rights mechanisms on women and girls, and women's journey, laws, and pains in general. In order to fulfill this uh, that objectives of the mandate, I endorse my predecessors, my predecessors to track approach on accountability and engagement. I acknowledge that there may be some perceived tensions in pursuing the two tracks of accountability and engagement simultaneously. To address this matter, I will help to write awareness of the complementarity of these two tracks. It must be understood that neglecting either of these tracks at the beginning of my mandate would be equivalent according to my thoughts, to depriving the PPRK population from international support. Accountability for ongoing and past human rights violations in and by the DPRK remains critical to human rights improvement and ensuring justice in the DPRK. I will continue to engage with all stakeholders, including governments, organizations, victims, and other groups to explore possible avenues, both judicial and non-judicial to pursue accountability and guarantee the rights of the victims. In 2024, to mark the 10th anniversary of the report of the Commission on Inquiry on Human Rights Situation in the DPRK, I will review the implementation of the recommendations made by the Commission of Inquiry uh, that could amount, as you know, to crimes against humanity. On engagement, I have to admit that it's very difficult, difficult to be creative after 18 years of work of the mandate. However, I think that a path forward would be to create new synergies by working with the other stakeholders in an integrated manner. This approach could be worked out, focusing on more specific situations and groups such as women, as women and girls, persons with disabilities, detainees, of course, people subject to forced labor and overseas workers. I am also planning, I'm also planning to look into issues such as the right to health, forced labor, corruption, and human trafficking. I intend to seek advice from the organizations and people who have established contacts with the DPRK. I will continue to send messages to the DPRK through official channels, sending communications, and I will also try to send messages and directly through other channels by talking to various actors, including neighboring countries and other key countries. Finally, I wish to reiterate, however, that the success of these partial efforts is possible only through the commitment of many different actors in the international community, such as governments who have rapport with the DPRK's authorities, UN agencies, this is very important, 
regional organization, NGOs, and also the academic work from where we can, among others, of course. All of them, all of us should uh, keep in mind that what is at stake is North Korean people's life and human dignity. It is the people of the DPRK who need the international solidarity and are entitled to it. If respect and protection of human rights is a shared goal, it's also a shared responsibility. Thank you for your attention. Special Rapporteur Salmon, thank you very much for the presentation. Again, you, you presented a terrific report. Regrettably, uh, several UN member states have an issue with the facts. And I have to say that this organization, I'm executive director of the US Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, HRNK. We have endeavored for more than 20 years to do one very important thing, find out and tell the truth about human rights in the DPRK. And our next two speakers have been true pillars of this organization. Our first speaker is going to be uh, Mr. Joseph Bermudez, Jr., Joe Bermudez, who uh, for more than a decade now has been following, reporting on North Korea's detention system, political prison camps, Pagiso political prison camps, Kyohaso re-education through forced labor camps, which Ambassador Palaskas mentioned in his remarks. We have the scientific evidence. We corroborate the satellite imagery with KP testimony, and we come up with a more or less complete picture of what's going on within North Korea's detention system. Again, as Ambassador Palaska said, up to 200,000 men, women, and children held under brutal conditions at these detention facilities. Uh, Joe, we wish you are here with us in person, but we are fortunate they're joining us virtually, so I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And by the way, Joe Bermudez is one of the world's top satellite imagery analysts. We are so fortunate that he has taken this interest. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about that as well, Joe, why this is a very personal issue to you. And perhaps you can share a little bit about your, your family history there as well. Oh, you'll have to excuse me, I'm fighting a cold. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that, Greg, that was uh, too nice of you. Uh, I'm Joe Bermudez. I'm the senior advisor and senior imagery analyst for HRNK. Uh, for the past 40, I don't know, say 35 years, I have been working in North Korean issues. And for the past 10 years, I've been doing so for uh, HRNK, looking at political prison camps and other points of uh, human rights abuse in North Korea. Over those years, I can honestly say without exaggeration whatsoever, that I have looked at every square meter in North Korea from space, sometimes, many times, multiple times. I have a short uh, presentation, and then if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or we could hold them to the end. <clears throat> we all know this, you, you've all said it already, it's quite obvious, North Korea is the most closed society in the world. Uh, the Kim regime has been horrific in its uh, retention of power. It has committed human rights abuses on an unprecedented scale. Uh, this, this is worthy of bringing to the public attention. It's worthy of working against and bringing those who have committed crimes against humanity to justice, whether they be escapees or defectors uh, that, I, that I know of or have personally interviewed. Uh, describe a complete lack of any legal due process. It, it's all about political reliability and uh, patronage systems and, you know, bribery. Uh, and, and legal process is pro forma. The nation is uh, under tremendous political su surveillance, whether it be uh, little block wardens who monitor their particular block in a town or a floor monitor in an apartment building. Uh, there's, there's oppression, incarceration, detainees and political camps are used to force labor, often under horrendous conditions. And you know, while I can't see um, you know, people being brutalized individually, 
in a camp, I can see the conditions under which they work and how they're treated. You can see how people are being marched to and from an area. You can see uh, guards on either side of them. You can see the hovels that they live in. There are a lot of things you can tell. <coughs> Excuse me. We also hear the human rights abuses inside these detention facilities, but also outside. An overall nation of oppression, unless you're in the politically leading classes. Uh, as I mentioned, past 10 years, we've been working to document, to penetrate this closed society in the best we can. We've done so by combining and fusing together official statements and documents, the UNCOI, which we testified at, uh, NGO media reports. Occasionally, we see NGOs talking about something or media reports about something and they don't even understand what they're, they understand what they're talking about, but they don't understand the environment in which they're in. And you sometimes see things, hear things, and understand things that add to that understanding of what it's like to live in North Korea. There's occasional ground imagery. We fuse that with what we know. We have a number of escape B interviews, defector interviews, and we have access to other sources. So taking this all together, we fuse it and we use satellite imagery to confirm or negate you know, information that we've had to, <clears throat> excuse me, to produce timelines of facility development. And timelines are very important. If an individual who was abused in the camp says that during you know, these years, they saw this, this, and this happen, Okay, that you know they built an extra dormitory, you know, to, for increased number of prisoners being you know returned from China. Well, we can go in and we can see that. Okay? This helps when you you find at the end. I hope we do the individuals who ran these camps and who were responsible for it. We can tie hard evidence to their participation and confirm what former detainees have said. So we come up with a report like this. This is a scene of. Uh, a Koaso, number 12, in the northern part of North Korea. And we've pieced all of this together. What's in this building? What's in that building? This is important because some of the uh, former escapees uh, tell us, well, I would come out of my building and go to the right. And then you'd have to ask them, well, how many steps or how long? And you figure out where they're going. Some of the, th these people are stressed and you have to tease the information out of them in a way that they feel comfortable and safe. And they, they feel like they can share things that they wouldn't normally share. As we do this, we build up a picture. It's like piecing together a puzzle. And this is a piece of the puzzle we showed here. Since 2012, we have produced 22 satellite reports. Detailed, I believe I saw some on the table in front of you. Uh, one of these, uh, on the Chungsan number 11 detention facility was actually the equivalent of 12, 11 or 12 reports from 12. Because it was, a, it was a large area, physical area, large part of a county, a gun, and they had little dispersed facilities throughout. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of images of that. So we had to do a report on each one. What was interesting is that the primary uh, former detainee only saw part of this overall facility. We were able through satellite imagery, and I'll show you that momentarily, to identify additional facilities and their uh, development over time that this former detainee did not see. The use of satellite imagery has challenges. It's not the be all and end all. Okay, you, you know, satellites are moving very fast. Okay? So they only have little time over an area of interest. There's weather. Weather is horrendous over North Korea at times. Uh, up until recently, uh, satellite imagery has been very expensive. There's also the challenge of latency. Latency in this case is saying we hear about an event that happened today and we have an image that was taken today. By the time I get to see it, it's tomorrow. Okay? Uh, there's also timing of satellite imagery collection. Most people don't understand until very, very recently, commercial satellite imagery only collected images between 
approximately 11 in the morning to about two in the afternoon. That's because that's when the sun's the highest and you need lots of sun. This is changing and new constellations of satellites are going up that will be earlier and be later. This, this widens the uh, timing of the day that we can collect imagery. And if we collect multiple images over one site on a single day, we can begin to tell pattern of life. When do the detainees go out to the mine? When do they come back? When do they rest? Things of that nature. Uh, to be effective, all this satellite imagery needs to have an analyst with considerable experience, not only technical knowledge, but you have to know about North Korean culture, Korean culture in general, and also about the government and how the government works. These are challenging things to find in a single individual. Uh, there are a few and we try to train additional ones. This is all the imagery that one satellite collected over 30 days over North Korea. Okay. Not all these locations are over locations where there are political prison camps. Most of them are over strategic areas. And I should point out, this is the public archive. All satellite companies have a private catalog and a public catalog. The private catalog is for those individuals, organizations who purchase imagery from the company under the condition that it's kept private. And this could be governments, this could be individuals. This isn't very much, but when you combine it with other satellite companies, uh, you can get a much broader area, but you still face a big challenge. Okay? This is what it looked like over the Korean Peninsula just a few days ago. You, know, you say, well, you could see the area on the East Coast. Well, yes, I can see the area on the East Coast, but there's a haze over it. And that, that, that interferes with interpretation and degrades what you can see. Okay. The benefits though, are we able to see and go anywhere in the world? That's great. Each individual image is, covers a very wide area. And often when a specific area of interest for economic or you know, strategic reasons is collected and is put in the public archive, it might include part of a camp or all of a camp. And that benefits us. Uh, we also have a unique opportunity uh, for the past several years of having the US intelligence agencies declassify older satellite imagery from the 60s all the way through the early 80s. This allows us to build a better timeline using declassified satellite imagery of the organization of a detention facility. The other thing that this provides us is satellite imagery that is, once you've looked at enough of these facilities, you begin to see certain characteristics and you can see other facilities around the nation. This helps us to expand what we know about the political detention facilities in North Korea that will allow us to further investigate when the opportunity presents itself. I mentioned most of this before. Uh, we use it to confirm what the Keynes and escapees say. Okay? Uh, it helps us to expand our knowledge of the nationwide nature of the political camps. They're dispersed and most of them are very small. There are exceptions that are very large, but most of them are pretty small. Uh, we can, as I mentioned, identify uh, facilities that weren't mentioned by anybody. And the, the establishment of timelines is very important when you're bringing a criminal case up against somebody or an organization. Here's an example of the Chung San number 11 detention facility. Our uh, primary uh, informant uh, was there in the uh, 2020, I believe it was, maybe a little earlier. However, and she mentioned some spots and you know, I can actually point some of them being there back in 1975, which this detainee had no idea about. So we're able to build it up. But this is what an image looks like from the 1970s. It helps us tremendously in understanding the growth and operations of the camp. This is that same camp after I took all the information that the detainee, former detainee had. Those are those green hexagons. And as you can see, she established naming for them. She called them Detainee Division 9. 
you know, two, three. And we took that information, other information, and we produced individual reports on each one of these people, the locations. But we also identified other things. Notice the red hexagons. These are hexagons that have identical characteristics to the green hexagons. These are places that she never had the opportunity to visit, but were developed after this detainee was released and then she defected. Okay. So by doing this and combining it with the declassified imagery, we are able to build a timeline. This is important when you're pursuing a criminal case. This is what the detainee called, uh, what we call divisions B and C. Okay. Notice that there are two larger rectangles in the left-hand side of the image. Now, this was taken in 2002. This is what it looks like in 2019. Notice the difference. Many of these camps are, I want to say living organisms, but there's certainly organi organizations that are being changed. Uh, they're being, some of them are being raised, some of them are being expanded. And by knowing this, we help piece together the operation and we can bring this into a court of law going forward. Okay. This is Kwanli So number 25, following in the northeast part of the country. This is a more formal type detention facility. When we were doing our initial uh, study of it, we went through the numbers of images, and all of a sudden we found this little facility in the bottom of this image. In 2010, it was built. Well, in the image, we first identified it in 2010. All those red triangles are guard positions, okay? And you expect to see some around the perimeter, not necessarily this many, but you see some of them. Look how many are around that little building in the southern part of the facility. 10, around, you know, a couple hundred meters. That, that, that's, that's a distinguishing characteristic. And when we zoom in on it, we see this high, what we identify as a high security compound. Look how high the walls are. For you, it might be a little difficult, but look at the shadow. That, that's one building inside a very, very high walled compound. The, uh, you see a little compound to the, just to the right of it. That was built later on. And because of the wall and its positioning, uh, this may be for solitary confinement, but we, we can't say that at this point, but we're keeping that in mind when we get additional information. The support building, which was built at the same time as the walled compound, is likely for guards and you know administration of some sort. But this is within a highly secured detention facility. This is the Tong Song Ni uh, Kowaso, uh, just south of Sinuiju. Uh, we went back and we tried to trace its development. This is 1968 and we don't see it. The only thing we see that is in the future imagery is this one building. Okay. If I go forward in time, 1977, another declassified satellite image. Wow, we see a large walled compound with four of the red triangles, which are guard positions. Why isn't there any on the right side? Well, from what we can understand, the right side where those green dots are, oh, where the guard barracks are, uh, a school, a training facility. So there really isn't need of that because all the guards and security personnel are there. Then we move forward in time. Here it is in 2021. Okay. See the dotted line? They built additional walls. Okay. The, uh, they have a developed a larger infrastructure for administration. And we have some information about it. And speaking to uh, a former uh, resident of North Korea, we're able to develop greater information about what goes on here. One thing I would point out is if you look at the, in the center, I don't know if you can see my mouse, right in here, you see this open garden, okay? And you see this greenhouse, another greenhouse here. If we go back in time, 77, that large area was a factory of some sort, and there were no greenhouses up here. What this suggests to us is that the prison population increased 
and they had to feed themselves. Most prisons have to feed themselves. And the, the, uh, the uh, detainees are used for that as well as hard labor elsewhere. In another area of human rights abuse, uh, we were able to identify a brutal execution of senior North Korean officials. Okay. This is uh, just north, uh, northeast, I believe, of a military academy. And what we see is a typical firing range. You can see that this is the firing line where you would normally bring your rifle and you'd shoot downrange into these little bays at the top. But what we see right here in the center, where it says targets, are posts with people tied to them. What we see here are anti-aircraft guns. So normally, uh, when we've seen executions around the world, it's been done by a group of uh, troops or security officials. We use pistols or rifles to shoot at an individual. Okay, uh, very effective. Uh, but here we see a host of individuals tied to poles. And this, this gun on the left is not your ordinary gun. It's an anti-aircraft gun. Those are four machine guns on it. And each one of those machine guns fires a, a bullet around that is thicker than my thumb. And there are six of them, right? Six of those uh, pieces of equipment. And each has four machine guns on it. That's 24 heavy machine guns firing at individuals who are very close to them. When this occurred, these people were literally blown apart. That, that's no exaggeration whatsoever. These aren't just simple bullet wounds. They were literally dismembered by this high rate of fire. Going forward, you know, assuming that we have additional funding and personnel, we're going to continue work updating known detention facilities. That's important. We need to keep the work we've done before going forward, okay? And also filling in gaps historically. We have even, we have 15, 15 plus reported additional facilities that we haven't written reports on yet. We have to get to those. We want to develop the historical timelines that I've spoken about so often. They're very important when you're pursuing a case. Uh, we also want to produce um, reports on previously unreported detention facilities that we have identified. We want to expand what we know to uh, what we would call detention, I mean, penitentiaries here in the United States, where you would have common criminals. And it's hard to make a distinction in North Korea because depending on who arrested you or who you uh, uh, upset in the political uh, system, you could go to either one. But uh, we know that there are abuses here. We, we've heard that from former detainees. And additionally, we want to produce 3D renderings of these facilities. Why a 3D rendering? Well, a picture is nice. And while I, having looked at a lot of satellite, satellite imagery, can read and visualize what's there, average people sometimes have a challenge looking straight down at something. But if you provide a 3D rendering, you can circle around it and people can manipulate the image so they can understand more clearly what they're looking at. This is an example of penitentiary in Sariwan. It uh, looks like penitentiaries elsewhere in South Asia. And with that, uh, I will either answer any questions now or I can hold my questions uh, till later. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. No, thank you very much. I think we'll take all questions all together once we're done with all presentations. Uh, Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. You, you, you mentioned the, the execution by ZBU-4 anti-aircraft machine guns at Kangon Military Academy. We have spoken with North Korean defectors, escapees, who were forced to watch the execution of colleagues. They say, strangest thing, bodies are pulverized, turned into pink mist. All that's left is the boots, the shoes, the feet. Imagine how gruesome those executions are. And Joe was able to basically corroborate reports by North Korean escapees. And we're actually uh, able to, to collect the imagery needed to prove that, unfortunately, regrettably, this is indeed a 
rather widespread practice in the DPRK. Joe, you mentioned how challenging it is to document the chain of command and control in North Korea, those responsible for crimes against humanity and other egregious human rights violations. We are fortunate to have the world's top experts on chain and command control issues in the DPRK. Bob Collins, just like Joe Bermudez, has authored multiple reports for HRNK on North Korea's Songbun, the social classification system, Pyongyang Republic, from cradle to grave. We have sampled some of our publications. Please feel free to take them away. Our colleagues at the permanent mission of the Republic of Korea have also generously shared the white paper um, published by the Korea Institute of National Education. So they're yours to keep, please. Um, and um, Bob, uh, let me uh, turn it over to you, sir. Well, thank you, Greg. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak here at this uh, August body. Um, and when we discuss um, command and control of the prison camps, um, I need to provide some sort of context within to, to assist in that understanding. Um, North Korea is run by the Supreme Leader. That's an ideological position. Um, of course, that is Kim Jong-un, um, but he also holds a number of other positions like the General Secretary of the Korean Workers' Party, the Chairman of the State Administrative Council, which runs the government, um, and he's a Supreme Commander of the military. Um, in that sense, um, he has the authority to command any institution or any person that works in those institutions directly through one of those chairs. Um, but most significantly, the concept of supreme leader, which is ideological, um, is the, the one of the most important. Why is it the one of the most important? Because the people that go to political prison camps are violators of some form of North Korean ideology. Um, and that's a critical part to understand. So Kim Jong-un employs... Um, the Korean Workers' Party to run the party state. The government doesn't run the state. The military doesn't run the state. The Korean Workers' Party runs the state. Um, and they use, so consequently, they use party policy and ideology to uh, provide a basis of understanding what the rules and regulations are for everybody in society. Um, the, the, the law is there generally for um, uh, to establish some sort of criminal code, but the security personnel on the ground and in the leadership of the security agencies, the Ministry of State Security and the National Police, which is the Ministry of Social Safety, um, those individuals use um, Supreme Leader directives, uh, party policy, and ideology to, to uh, do their investigations and to do their apprehensions and then push the uh, prisoners to an appropriate uh, prison facility. There are seven different types of prisons in North Korea. Obviously, uh, the ones that we're focusing on at this particular time are the political prison camps. Um, and Joe has done a great briefing on discussing that. The, uh, um, but so for everybody to understand how um, North Korean society works. It is done through the direct leadership of the party and the supreme leader. Um, consequently, the things such as the monolithic guidance system states that the supreme leader guides everything. He's the one that leads everything. Um, then there's a monolithic ideology system which says the only ideology that is permitted is that the one that comes from the supreme leader and the Korean Workers Party. Um, individuals are rated by, although they don't necessarily study the exact nature of it, but the, certainly the security personnel do, by the 10 principles of monolithic ideology. Those are very important concepts to understand. That really is, it, if you're an American citizen, you understand that you um, live by the Constitution. Um, that's the overwhelming uh, law document of the United States of America. Well, the, the dominant work uh, in North Korea that people are subject to is the 
the 10 principles of monolithic ideology or otherwise TPMI, this is an abbreviation. Um, now, the concept of the DPRK constitution and the criminal code, that is not something, you will not find a single North Korean defector slash escapee who says that they studied the DPRK constitution in school, never happened. Of course, if you're in an American school or you're in a South Korean school, they studied um, uh, those concepts uh, um, uh, quite deeply. Um, now, um, even the laws of North Korea are dominated by the party. Kim Il-sung set up the law system originally in 1960s by telling, by instructing everybody and all the lawyers and all of the judges um, who are monitored by the party that the law in the courts will be judged how well they, they uh, coincide with party policy. In other words, party policy takes precedence over the law within the court system. Um, and uh, um, it's been this way for more than 50, 60 years, excuse me. Um, so in the seven different, um, seven different types of uh, jails or prisons in North Korea, of course, at the high, highest level um, is the one that we're talking about here, and that's a political prison. And down at the bottom is your common commok or jail that you would find at a village police box or a county police station. Um, and then there's several in between. You have ones that are designed for long, long-term uh, detention, others for short-term detention, other are labor camps, but there are seven different types. Um, and for North Korean citizen to be arrested and to go into one of those facilities, it would be based on their relationship um, with, uh, with, the, with the local police. Like Joe was talking about patriotism and bribery play a great deal in uh, um, the relationship between a village citizenry and the local policeman. Um, and it's not uncommon that um, those issues that are below the ideology level um, are handled um, through those patronage and, and bribery scandals so they can get away with things. But what they can't get away from is the ideological uh, value uh, um, errors that they make according to the TPMI, according to the charter document of the, uh, the Korean Workers' Party, and obviously the, the strategic, excuse me, the directives from the Supreme Leader. Um, that's problematic. So as the Ministry of State Security and the Ministry of Social Safety personnel from village, city, county, province, and the national level, as they deal with the North Korean citizenry, they use this ideology uh, and the perceived violations to judge where, what level uh, many of these individuals, uh, these are those that are arrested, what level they're going to go to. Um, certainly the Supreme Directive uh, uh, of, of the Supreme Leader uh, is going to be uh, the most important concept that they will listen to. And so any indications that a North Korean citizen has violated um, these, these uh, ideological principles or the Supreme Leader directives is then hustled through uh, the Yeshim Gua, which is the investigator arms of those two agencies, um, a, a place where they do probably the initial, not probably, where they do the initial part of, of, of brutal treatment and torture um, to, to get to confessions. And um, the confessions will be a result of days of torture, and then that gives justification to move them, move them up. However, if a person is directly uh, uh, violating, obviously, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un or the or portrait of Kim Il-sung or Kim Jong-il or something of that nature. It is a very hustled process that gets them to the camp and no court intervention can assist them. Um, now, the control, the command and control that was discussed uh, earlier, I want to give you a different look at what that is. Command and control is really a originated as a military concept by a German general in the 19th century. And it applies to all militaries and then it's moved on to be 
work used in all institutions. But North Korea doesn't quite work under the concept of command and control. It's better said to say that they work under the concept of control and command. And the control is from the Korean Workers Party. So institutionally, you would have, regardless of the military or the security agencies, or just a, 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 some other institution within the government, it is the party chief within the embedded party committee that uh, is actually in the control seat as opposed to the command, which might be, uh, if you talk about government level, you're talking about a people's committee at the village, county, city, and provincial level or the Supreme People's Assembly at the national level. But it is the embedded party committee, and it's in every institution, every single institution, no exceptions, um, that that authority that runs down uh, from the Supreme Leader through the party into those organizations. And so when we narrow the focus on the political presence, there's if you looked at and thought of it as a command and control, you would think, okay, it goes from uh, Kim Jong-un as the uh, State Affairs Commission chairman through the Ministry of State Security or Ministry of Social Safety, down through the prison bureaus of those two organizations, down to the camps, the political prison camps. That would be the command and control process. But, but the control and command process, which is, uh, um, is the actual lead process uh, runs from the Supreme Leader through the Organization Guidance Department of the Korean Workers Party, which monitors the party committees that are embedded in each of these institutions. And it's in every prison and certainly it's, it's in every um, uh, political, uh, political prison camp. So when you look at the organization of a political prison camp on a personnel function, and a mission function. There is a commander within that political prison camp, of course. He works for the Ministry of State Security or the Ministry of Social Safety. But the person who really judges that camp process and effectiveness as determined by Supreme Leader Directive is the party committee chief. And with him, the party committee organization secretary. Those are the people that judge whether the, the camp is doing what it is supposed to be doing. Um, and certainly uh, I can get into some gruesome, gruesome details, but the important part is that there is a direct line of human, a direct line of responsibility of human rights denial from the Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un to that uh, camp commander and all of the personnel that work for him. Now, having said that, there's a concept that needs to be understood about why are these so brutal at the camps? Why, why are the guards and the, and, the, and the camp command structure so brutal to the prisoners? And you've all read about all the torture they go through and the food denial and, and things of that nature. Every single North Korean, no exceptions, starts in the fourth grade of elementary school doing what they call Seng Hwa Chung Hwa. Seng Hwa Chung Hwa is lifestyle self-critique. So if you're in the fourth grade, every Saturday, the teacher will have a session of Seng Hwa Chung Hwa and you are be designated to stand up and say, according to my monitoring of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il sayings, read monolithic uh, ideology, um, this is what I failed to do um, this past week to be consistent with that ideology. And so you have to self-confess. And the uh, important part is that another person stands up and says what you did wrong also. That goes for every person in North Korea. Now go to the camp commanders and the camp uh, personnel sections. They are also go through this process every Saturday. And the party chief and the organization secretary monitor what they say and what they do. And they report that back up through the organization and guidance department. And then overall, all overall report goes to the Supreme leader. It's critical to understand that, the, that what the, these camp commanders and the personnel do to the, do to the prisoners 
is to treat them badly. They have to say, I didn't treat them badly enough. That's what they have to confess. I didn't treat them bad enough. I didn't torture enough. I didn't hurt enough. I didn't deny food enough. That's what they have to confess. And they have to do that better. Lastly, from the Supreme Leader's perspective, these people that are in the camps are regarded as poisonous grass and they must be uprooted and de destroyed in any way possible. And so that is the nature of the torture. That is the nature of the food denial. That is all the bad treatment that you can imagine. And that's why very few people come out of these political things. I'll end with that. Thank you. Well, Bob, thank you very much. Yes. Chain of control and command. One dynastic ruler, one ideology, the TPMI, the 10 principles of monolithic ideology, and ultimately the OGD, three initials, the organization and goddess department that rules it all. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Um, we, uh, we do have a question. Uh, we, we got this online. Uh, this is uh, Park Chung Yu from a young from the Young Leaders Forum on the Korean Peninsula. Um, the question mentions Ambassador Lee that you met with uh, the younger generation just a few weeks ago, um, and uh, basically, um, this gentleman says that it is shocking to see. The facilities of satellite imagery. It is shocking to see evidence of execution by anti-aircraft machine guns. Um, would it be possible to use satellite imagery <coughs> as an educational tool from young South Koreans and others? Joe, are you still online with us? Yes, I am. Yes. Would you would you mind answering this question? So, could we turn your satellite imagery? analysis and all of these reports into an educational curriculum for the younger generations? I believe you could. Uh, you'd have to make it age appropriate, of course. But <coughs> certainly, uh, it would also be useful if there were some experiential learning too. For example, um, there must be some place, you know, I've been in Seoul a number of times, you know, take them to a wall building and just have them you know, walk around and look up and look down. Uh, have them uh, work on a field if they're not from the countryside. Things like that. And uh, for one day, uh, give them what we have been told that uh, former escapees had the opportunity to eat. I think experiential learning plus a, a curriculum built upon what uh, Bob has mentioned and the satellite imagery together, fused together, could make an appropriate curriculum. Thank you, Joe. And you have already trained many HRNK younger staff members and interns. Well, in the basic <laughs> image, which is perfect. A question from Lee Han Gil from the Young Leaders Forum of the Korean Peninsula. When did we realize that these were detention facilities? Well, we have performed research at NARA, the National Archives. We knew about North Korean detention facilities. This is declassified reporting by intelligence agencies in the USA. We knew about these facilities as early as the late 1940s. However, this was the norm in the communist world, as regrettably we all know. So no particular attention was paid to these North Korean facilities uh, in the public realm. <coughs> This all began in the 1990s, during and after the days of the Great Famine, when more and more North Koreans became, uh, began escaping. Right now, there are 34,000 former North Koreans who have resettled in South Korea. Many others have resettled in other countries as well. Um, I am under very strict instructions uh, issued by Ambassador, uh, my, my good friend Riddis, Ambassador Paul Oskars. We are out of time, but if you have more questions, please do email them to me, Greg Scarlatti, Executive Director of HRK. The email is executive.director at hrnk.org. I will be happy to forward your questions to our speakers. So once again, Ambassador Paulowskas, thank you. 
and the permanent mission of Lithuania for hosting. I wish to thank uh, again Ambassador Kuhanik and our colleagues from Czechia and hearty congratulations on the National Day of Czechia. We're very happy that you have spent this uh, very meaningful day with us. Hearty congratulations to all people of Czechia. Ambassador Juan, we have been honored by our presence. Thank you so much. It's so great to see that the Republic of Korea indeed is once again a leader on, on this very important issue. We're truly honored by our presence, the presence of all our colleagues from the ROK permanent mission. Kristen, great to be partners. And of course, uh, once again, Ambassador Ishin Ma, uh, Special Rapporteur Elizabeth Salmon, you mm -hmm. have honored us with your presence and your terrific remarks. Let me thank everyone at the permanent mission of Lithuania and my colleagues from HRNK, Raymond Ha, Director of Operations and Research, Lauren Morrison, Operations Associate, Kia Fatahi, uh, Ihon Jo, Research Intern, Sandra Scarlatio, Research Intern, you, you've been terrific, and Christina Ludicate, uh, who has been a, a true pillar of this operation. She has been the, uh, the coordinator of everything that has happened today and everything that has happened over the past few weeks. So, Christina, thank you very much. With that, Master Polaskas, I'll turn it over to you. Well, just to say that we have the modest, uh, let's say, refreshments and then and also some food. So please enjoy. Really, I would say these, this is important also physically to be and to, really to, to get to know each other better. Um, we as Lithuanians um, will be engaging and we will help for, with other events. So we already spoke with Greg about possibly some other follow up events here in New York and perhaps also in Washington DC. So let me keep, keep us posted and send a push a really the safe trip to those who will be traveling to Washington or other places. Have a good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you.